Welcome to the lecture series on vitamins and nutrition. Today we are going to continue with vitamin B12 and uh, today we are going to discuss the aspects of storage of vitamin B12 and we are going to elaborately look at the metabolic role of vitamin B12 and how vitamin B12 is essential in many kind of methyl transfer reactions and how vitamin B12 plays a very essential role in fatty acid metabolism and we are also going to look at different aspects of vitamin B12 deficiency. So we will continue from the previous session and uh, if you look at it this particular vitamin it is also known as extrinsic factor. So if you say it is an extrinsic factor then obviously there should be a intrinsic factor. So this kind of anemia where the transportation of vitamin B12 is affected because there is a problem in the carrier molecule that is complexed with extrinsic factor. So something like this, you have an extrinsic factor and you have an intrinsic factor and both extrinsic factor and intrinsic factor should interact and uh, only upon this interaction it will be able to go across the gastrointestinal tract. So if you look at the dietary requirement of vitamin, so we have approximately 200 nanograms per day. So in the absence of intrinsic factor, inadequate amounts of cobalamin are absorbed. So the dietary requirement is approximately 200 nanograms per day. So this kind of deficiency where the dietary intake of vitamin B12 is affected is what we call it as megaloblastic anemia. So this name megaloblastic anemia is a terminology which is concerned with the morphology of the RBCs that are formed. So you see the RBC appears to be abnormal because hemoglobin the key molecule in the RBC is not properly formed because of deprivation of this particular vitamin. So this kind of anemia and you should also not confuse megaloblastic anemia with other categories of megaloblastic anemia because even under megaloblastic anemia there are many uh, kinds of anemia or different etiologies for our anemia. So under megaloblastic anemia because you could have megaloblastic anemia even in certain cases of hemoglobinopathies we say it is a hemoglobin related anomalies we have megaloblastic anemia. But if you closely look at if it is going to be connected with vitamin B12 then that category of megaloblastic anemia is called perinicious anemia. So you see there in perinicious megaloblastic anemia that will be the most appropriate way of describing the anemia concerned with vitamin B12 deficiency. The key molecule as you look here the intrinsic factor is basically uh, not there in sufficient quantity to enable efficient absorption of extrinsic factor vitamin B12. So that is why it is called perinicious anemia. So whether this condition can be reversed? Absolutely. If you could supplement with vitamin B12 you can change the condition but the point over here is the intrinsic factor. So the rate limiting step is not with extrinsic factor but with intrinsic factor. There are cases where there would be very less amount of vitamin B12 available in the diet that can be corrected. So if it is going to be dietary deficiency it can be corrected. But if there is an inherent deficiency of intrinsic factor you need to really look at little more into the physiology of the individual and find out what could be the reason for intrinsic factor deficiency. So here in this case it is a rate limiting step intrinsic factor decides how much amount of vitamin B12 would be available for absorption across the gastrointestinal tract. So we have seen this and if you look at it there are basically three plasma transport proteins transcobalamin 1 and 3 differing only in carbohydrate structure and they are secreted by leukocytes. Although approximately 90 percent of plasma vitamin B12 circulating binds to these protein. It is only the transcobalamin 2 which is responsible for transporting vitamin B12 into cells. 
So you see over here, first vitamin B12 has to cross the gastrointestinal tract. So that's a barrier or that's a rate limiting step. And even if it manages to cross the gastrointestinal tract and goes into circulation, again there are some carrier proteins which will enable vitamin B12 to go inside the cells. And this key protein, what you call it as transcobalamin 2, is that particular category of protein which plays a very important role and enables sufficient quantity of vitamin B12 to go inside the cells. So you see over here, liver contains almost 200, 2000 to 5000 micrograms of stored vitamin B12. So that's pretty good storage levels. So since daily loss of 1 to 2 microgram, it may not be like really felt. So cumulatively over a period of 3 years, you find the deficiency and people start showing symptoms of vitamin B12. So that's why, you know, even in a dietary way, if you're not taking vitamin B12 precisely every day, your storage would actually compensate. But the question is whether the person has any deficiency for synthesizing intrinsic factor or is there any other complication connected with the availability of intrinsic factor. So that's the key. If intrinsic factor is available and the dietary intake of vitamin B12 is available, then there should not be any problem. So here, it, it's more likely that the dietary deficiency may not be a major cause for vitamin B12 related anemias, but rather the mechanisms involved in the transportation of vitamin B12. So that's the role where all biochemists have contributed in understanding how vitamin B12 gets across the system and finally reaches the place where it has to in performing all the biochemical functions. Now, this is a very interesting reaction. In the previous discussion, we have seen this reaction. So I want you to refresh and start from here so that we will understand exactly what kind of mechanism or what kind of chemical reactions vitamin B12 helps in our routine physiology. So you look over here. So this is methyl malonyl CoA. So this is a key starting molecule. And this molecule has to get converted into succinyl CoA. So you might look at succinyl CoA. What is this particular molecule? So if you look at the white citric acid cycle, so you see there succinyl CoA. So succinyl CoA is an important intermediate. We get succinyl CoA from alpha ketoglutarate. And alpha ketoglutarate, in turn, you get it from D isocitrate. And D isocitrate comes from cis aconitate and yeah it starts as a citric acid and yet the citric acid is synthesized from oxaloacetate and acyl coa so this is a cycle it's repeated again and again now the point what i want to emphasize so succinyl coa is a very important key molecule because from succinyl coa the reaction proceeds to have succinic acid and then it goes further to form fumaric acid malic acid, malate, and again, finally, oxaloacetate. So it goes like round and round. Now, this ingredient, I would call it as the intermediate compound, succinyl CoA, and most of these intermediate compounds, for that matter, can be a starting point or could be the initiation point for the citric acid cycle to go uh, on circles. Now, there could be other compounds that might enter the citric acid cycle because it's a citric acid cycle and it starts with oxaloacetate and it keeps replenishing and the process keeps going. But at any given stage, if the molecule needs to go inside, see uh, what I'm trying to convey over here, the succinyl CoA, which is an important molecule in the course of citric acid cycle reactions. And uh, it could be produced from this root but alternatively, there are other pathways which also end as succinyl CoA. So if it's going to end as succinyl CoA, then this will contribute to the overall pool of succinyl CoA in our physiology. So that succinyl CoA would now be a raw material which could be processed further down the cycle and uh, to produce the energies. So that's the reason if you look at uh, 
the way how this particular reaction moves in, it tells you that adenosyl cobalamin is the coenzyme for the uh, enzyme methyl malonyl CoA mutase. So, this particular enzyme catalyzes the conversion of methyl malonyl CoA to succinyl CoA. See, look over here exactly what is happening. So, you find how many carbon atoms? 1, 2, 3. So, it is a 3 carbon atom. So, it is a propionic acid derivative. And uh, it is a propionic acid derivative in terms of 3 carboxylic, uh, 3 carbon atoms, but actually it is a dicarboxylic acid. So, it is a methyl substituted dicarboxylic acid. So, that is why we call it as methyl malonyl CoA mutase. So, here methyl malonyl actually it is a malonic acid. So, malonic acid is a tricarbon uh, and uh, dicarboxylic acid. So, oxalic acid as is a dicarboxylic acid, but 2 carbon atom. Malonic acid is a uh, dicarboxylic acid with 3 carbon atom and succinic acid as you see there it is a dicarboxylic acid with 4 atoms. So, the extra carbon atom that is the transition starting from malonic acid CoA to succinyl CoA. So, where do you get this extra methyl group? This extra methyl group is contributed by vitamin B12. So, that is why vitamin B12 is a rich methyl donor. In all methyl donation reactions, you find vitamin B12 as a coenzyme for the key enzymes that catalyze such reactions. See over here, the propionyl CoA is carboxylated to D-methyl malonyl CoA. So, the question is, where did I get this methyl malonyl CoA? So, methyl malonyl CoA in turn was synthesized from propionyl CoA because in propionyl CoA, it is actually a 3 carbon monocarboxylic acid. So, to make a dicarboxylic acid, there is a particular enzyme. Okay, so, there is carboxylation reaction and this leads to methyl malonyl CoA and this methyl malonyl CoA which is a D conformer gets rearranged or isomerized to L methyl malonyl CoA and rearranged to yield the succinyl CoA. So, from methyl malonyl CoA it gets to succinyl CoA via vitamin B12 dependent enzyme. So, hope you understand what I am trying to explain. So, to have this succinyl CoA and this succinyl CoA once synthesized or once derived from these metabolic reactions can directly find its way to citric acid cycle and once it enters the citric acid cycle pool of succinyl CoA the reaction goes on and on generating energy and other products or the metabolites that could be used in the continuation of the cycle and can also be the starting material for other sorts of chemical reactions happening inside the cell. Now, you look at this, the methyl malonyl CoA is formed from propionyl CoA and interesting enough, there is one more vitamin, vitamin biotin, vitamin B7. I think we have elaborately seen the role of biotin in this uh, series of lectures. I spoke about biotin sometime before and uh, we were discussing about biotin, avidin, conjugation and so on. If you could recollect that, it will be wonderful. And I want you to draw your attention to be aware of how methyl malonyl CoA can be synthesized from propionyl CoA by biotin as a cofactor. So, you see that it is converted to succinyl CoA by methyl malonyl CO mutase in a reaction that requires vitamin B12. So, this is what I am explaining right now. And once it goes to the stage of succinyl CoA, it enters the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. The following diagram demonstrates the uh, mentioned reaction. So, you see propionyl CoA, methyl malonyl CoA giving rise to succinyl CoA. This is the citric acid cycle I was describing and if you could recollect how each molecule in the citric acid cycle is extremely essential to carry over the reaction, okay, to keep the reaction going and uh, thereby each of the amino acids uh, that fundamentally uh, consider uh, one of the major products also contribute as intermediate compounds and join the pool of citric acid cycle. 
Now, if you look at the role of cobalamine, vitamin B12, it is also needed for the odd chain fatty acids. So, odd chain fatty acids like threonin, methionin, and the branched chain amino acids, leucin, isoleucin, valin. So, you say valin is basically isovaleric acid, leucin is n valeric acid, isoleucin is basically caproic acid. So, it is all kind of acid molecules, but you have an amino group in the alpha position, so that makes them amino acids. So, all these branched chain amino acids and odd chain amino acids for that for their metabolism you need cobalamin. So, the degradation of each of these compounds produces the same metabolite propionyl CoA. So, if you look at it what exactly this propionyl CoA earlier we saw propionyl CoA is the starting material to make methyl malonyl CoA and there is again a vitamin B biotin catalyzing or acting like a coenzyme for this particular carboxylase reaction. So, from propionyl to methyl malonyl. Now, what we are seeing here is how propionyl is synthesized. So, you see that the amino acids, odd chain fatty acids are the key. So, the degradation of each of these compounds produces propionyl and propionyl now can be carboxylated to give methyl malonyl and methyl malonyl in turn is converted into succinyl CoA. So, you see that for propionyl COA formation you need cobalamin and also once you get propionyl CoA it is going to go into a transition and finally find its way as a compound or a metabolite very essential for a metabolic role. So, you see the continuity of reaction propionyl CoA the source of propionyl CoA is or the odd, odd chain fatty acids and the branched amino acids and this propionic acid gets converted into methyl malonate which in turn gets converted to succinyl CoA. So, if you could understand vitamin B12 is needed in the early reaction continuation of the reaction and also further in the citric acid cycle contributing the pool of succinyl CoA. So, this is the picture if you could understand this picture this gives a representation of what I have been talking. So, you have propionyl CoA. So, you see their methionin, isoleucin, valin, threonin, odd chain fatty acid. So, all this gives rise to propionyl CoA and now you have propionyl CoA carboxylase in the presence of biotin gives you methyl malonyl CoA. Once you have methyl malonyl CoA, you have L methyl malonyl CoA and now the L methyl malonyl CoA gets converted back to succinyl CoA. So, you have methyl malonyl CoA mutase doing this reaction. This requires vitamin B12. Now, we have to look at fate of propionyl CoA in B12 deficiency. So, you see that propionyl CoA is a very key molecule. So, propionyl CoA eventually becomes succinyl CoA. So, propionyl CoA is the intermediate compound or the starting material and what is this common starting material? The source of common starting material these amino acids. So, suppose our body wants to make metabolize these amino acids you might be churning out sufficient amount of propionyl CoA, but until propionyl CoA goes through this pathway and become succinyl CoA there is no chance for it to enter the citric acid cycle that is what precisely happens. So, folate propionate in B12. So, since B12 is not there this entire path like this conversion step is affected drastically. Now, what happens is that this leads to an accumulation of methyl malonin CoA in the serum and it has been suggested as a possible source of neurological defects seen in cobalamin deficiency by decreasing lipid synthesis. So, you look over here, so vitamin B12 deficiency would lead to not only failure of the utilization of the essential pathway decreasing lipid synthesis, but you also find the byproducts get accumulated 
and this paves the way for neurologic defects. So, whenever you look at a vitamin and if the vitamin is going to contribute for a reaction, either the reaction proceeds in a smooth manner and if it is not there, it is not going to happen and if this enzyme has a very close association with other category of enzymes or chemical reactions or pathways, any effect on this particular enzyme could be predicted or visualized as an effect for all the set of enzymes that belong to this category. So, in our case, instead of enzyme, we have to consider the cofactor vitamin B12. So, what will happen? So, this excess methyl malonyl CoA. So, this is the one which has to be converted into uh, succinyl CoA inside the cell. So, B12 deficiency gets excreted in urine causing methyl malonic aciduria. So, this is a condition where you have more amounts of acidic nature sensed in the urine of people who suffer from this condition. So, you see over there which has been suggested possible source of neurological defects seen in deficiency by decreasing the synthesis. So, here you have a evidence to say that how directly vitamin B12 plays a very important role in directing the way how lipid synthesis might turn out to be in the positive direction. Now, not only that, one of the primary applications of cobalamin is its role in DNA synthesis okay, and the biochemical basis of megaloblastic anemia. So, the cause of megaloblastic anemia seen in strict vegetarians is fundamentally due to cobalamin deficiency of DNA synthesis and specifically you have this enzyme thymidylate synthase. So, this particular enzyme reaction that actually converts dump into TDMP. Okay, so, it is uridyl monophosphate to thymine monophosphate. So, this conversion is affected. So, you see there here you have the nucleotide and there is one more nucleotide dump to TDMP and you have thymidylate synthase catalyzing the reaction. So, you see there the thymidylate synthase catalyzed reaction you have NN methylene THF and DHF. So, here you have how the serine gets converted to glycine. So, if serine gets converted to glycine, yes, you have one more reaction happening over there and again NADPH is also being used for forming NAD plus. So, this would kind of establish the role of vitamin B12 in playing a very essential role for synthesizing the nucleotides. Okay, so, thymidate synthase. So, that is the key behind how vitamin B12 is very essential in the DNA synthesis of the cell. Now, implications of inadequate thymidylate synthase, synthesis. So, when there is no sufficient DTMP that restricts DNA but not RNA synthesis, this leads to the presence of large erythroid cells. So, what are erythroid cells? Erythroid cells are precursor RBC cells and they do have an installed nucleus unlike the other cells and the small nuclei contains a very high ratio of RNA to DNA. So, this is one indication uh, regarding their role. So, these cells are removed from circulation, the circulating erythrocytes and giving rise to anemia with an elevated uh, presence of megaloblasts. So, you, you get the entire picture. So, the inadequate DTMP restricts DNA and not RNA synthesis and this leads to the presence of large erythroid cells with small nuclei containing high ratio of RNA to DNA. So, if you look at it, these cells are removed from the circulation and once they are removed, it gives a thrust for erythropoiesis to happen or the formation of fresh RBCs from the stored reserves of the body. Now, we are also going to look at methionine metabolism. So, we have seen the overall metabolism of methionine. So, cobalamin is very important for the conversion of homocysteine into methionine. So, if you look at it, 
homocysteine conversion to methionine invariably have to use all the methods whatever that we have shown now and cobalamin must first undergo methyl transfer to form methyl cobalamin so that transition also happens so it receives the methyl group from the n5 methyl tetrahydrofurate so thus regenerating tetrahydrofolate to participate in other uh, one carbon transfer reactions in purine metabolism or pyrimidine metabolism so what do you really understand from this wherever you have a one carbon transfer methyl group transfer you should look for enzymes that can catalyze the reaction and if you find any interesting enzymes reported by default they should use a cofactor like the one which we are discussing right now so in that way this cofactor is extremely essential so if you go further this concept of folate trap so in cyanocobalamin deficiency methionine synthase reaction cannot occur n5 methyl tetrahydrofolate accumulates so other c1 donor forms of tetrahydrofolate cannot be formed so you see this has a direct impact on folic acid so the methionine synthesis from homocysteine ceases allowing trapping of folic acid pool as n5 methyl tetrahydrofolate and this diminishes the n5 n10 methylene tetrahydrofolate so you see over there this is what exactly happens so this phenomena is what we call it like folate trap so this is required for the methylation of dump to tmp thus its deficiency the thymidylate synthase reaction is slowed and dtmp levels drops and hence the dna synthesis is also slowed down due to non availability of deoxy ribonucleotides so you see there how this works it's all interlinked so vitamin b12 is extremely essential for folic acid metabolism so folic acid deficiency can be attributed to the endogenous mechanism of uh, requiring dump and uh, from dump to dtmp conversion is important and this exactly have an impact on folic acid metabolism which now leads to the kind of a trap so you see folic acid is also needed for anemia treatment anemia anemia therapy and vitamin b12 is also essential for anemia therapy but anemia is a general word it's a loose word it includes any kind of deficiency so we should like identify exactly what is the cause of anemia not only the morphological characters but the biochemical basis of how this particular deficiency condition is prevalent so you see that the roles of cobalamin and folic acid in methionine metabolism so it's like a kind of a triad okay so you need cobalamin and folic acid in methionine metabolism and contribution of methionine also in terms of cobalamin and folic acid is also understood well so if you look at this you find uh, methyl cobalamin where you have uh, methionine so then you have a big network going on over there down through you have thymidylate synthase okay it goes further to have methylene uh, what do you say compound and uh, you have finally the methyl derivative coming up over this in this reaction so in that way this depicts exactly how cobalamin folic acid and methionine are all related so we are going to quickly wind up and recollect what we have done so we have dealt with the transportation of vitamin b12 as extrinsic factor intrinsic factor then we dealt elaborately on different mechanisms that are catalyzed by vitamin b12 as a coenzyme and we also looked into the concept of folate trap so i am going to finish with a question enumerate the mechanism of absorption of vitamin b12 the next question would be give a note on the metabolic reactions concerned with folic acid trap and the third question would be enumerate different types of anemia that result from vitamin b12 deficiency 
and how it can be corrected. Thank you once again.